Here I have the Serious Jazz Practice Book for All Instruments by Barry Finitive from Sheer Music. I guess we all dream of that time in our lives when we have the ability to practice six hours a day, eight hours a day, maybe even more. Some musicians actually go through that and do that kind of work. I guess we can call it woodshedding. When I lived in Canada, I studied music there and I heard this term woodshedding or shedding all the time. So I looked it up. In jazz lingo, woodshedding is often shortened to shed or shedding. According to Paul Klemperer, a Texas-based jazz educator, woodshedding is more than just practicing. It is the place where you work out the techniques that form the foundation of your improvisational ability. I thought that was very well put. And if you want to do that, usually people do that when they're in college, the jazz performance program. It's hard to find the time if you have a job. This book is perfect if you want to lock yourself in the shed. There is also a jazz a sequel, a serious jazz book two that I'm probably going to make a, another video about this book. It took me a very long time to play through this. It's quite different from the first one. So I'll go through the content of this book, give you a very brief overview so you get an idea of what the book is about. And I'll also talk about some of my thoughts on practicing and my philosophy around practicing. I haven't talked too much about that in my videos, so I'll try not to rant too much, but uh, let's just uh, delve into the material, shall we? It's different chapters. The first chapter is just diatonic exercises, the diatonic scales in different sequ sequences or patterns. So you could play three notes. starts kind of basic and then he kind of permeates these things then he goes through all the different intervals so thirds fourths etc you get the idea so this is how i would do it i would practice this as if i were a saxophone player a horn player i'll find out the lowest note and the highest note on my instrument so if I'm in C major, the lowest note is E, and the highest note is, uh, uh, I guess, B. I always have to think about that depending on which guitar I'm playing. So then I'll try to get from the lowest note to the highest note with the pattern. And I don't worry too much about fingerings or which uh, position I'm in. I'm, this is kind of, if you already know your positions, I'm talking to those of you who kind of graduated from that, if you know what I mean. So I have a C major seven. The first diatonic study here is thirds. Somehow I got from the lowest to the highest. Again, if you are still struggling with positions and trying to learn different boxes, this book is not for you. It's again, it's the serious jazz practice book, right? So you have to be a little bit uh, more advanced than that. So I guess most of you could do that. That wasn't too hard, but can you do it in G flat? Can you do it with melodic minor? I would only work on major and melodic minor actually. So you wanna make sure that you can do it in the all the keys as it were, but don't try to play every pattern in every key. That's just gonna take, we're just on the first sequence here. So it's gonna take forever. Maybe pick randomly every day a new key. Find a system that works for you so you go through the keys at some point. Or maybe focus on the keys that you're struggling with. If you know how to do this in C major, well, you don't need to work on it in C major. So then he'll do the reverse. Which is just an inversion of that pattern. But as Miles Okasaki has pointed out, it's kind of redundant because when we play fourths, it's the same thing. So I wouldn't do the reversed, but I would do going up in thirds. Going up the scale in thirds and going one up and one down. So let's pick another key. I don't know, A major and do that. So the lowest note is E.
So he takes it a little bit further. He has some more variations on this. But for me, I think it's enough. If you can do all the intervals going up and one up and one down, and then with an added chromatic note, either from the lowest note or from the highest note, so a chromatic note from below. Or a chromatic from the top note of the interval. Actually, it works better with the bottom note in this case. It's a pattern I hear Papatini play all the time. So right now I'm not thinking too much about timing and how I can add rhythm to this. I'm not trying to improvise. I'm just making sure that I can do this all over the neck, right? So that if I run into an issue, like I noticed that on, let's say, B major is a problem, well, then I know that that's what I need to work on. Then maybe come back next day and work some more on B major until you've got that on your fingers. Then of course, all the other intervals. So fourths, fifths, and so on and so forth. For example, it's really nice with a sixth, one up, one down. That's another thing you could do if you find a pattern like that, that it's, hmm, I really like that. Mark, mark it down and put it into your book of favorite things that you can play. So I really like that sixth. So that means I'm going to work on some more scales. Maybe, I don't know, let's work on C melodic minor. Sixth going up one, down one. So I'm just on the first page still. So I need to move ahead and I'm gonna skip a lot. So I just hope you understand that there's way more in here than I'm giving you now. There are some examples of how to use this for improvisation. I haven't to listen to it. There's actually audio tracks too. I haven't listened to that. I'm, just, I'm using this book as a kind of a, a book of patterns, just like piano players have the Hannon, right? And trumpet players, I think, have a book uh, called uh, is it Arban something, a method book by somebody named Arban that all the trumpet players go through. And again, it's that when you need to really learn your instrument, you have to really play through all the keys. That's when you want to practice many hours a day. So if you have the opportunity to do that at some point in your life, it's good to have a book like this to work on. I have the Peter Sprague technique book and I lock myself in the woodshed for hours a day, I had like two months where I could do that. And uh, yeah, it was interesting. Not all musicians have done that, but a lot of musicians have. There's the famous Steve Vai eight hour workout. And you know, you hear stories about how Charlie Parker locked himself in the practice room for hours and then came back and just was this amazing player. All right, so next chapter is same thing with this time with triads. So same thing going up triads diatonically. The whole fretboard and one up, one down. And here you do want to play them down. So let's pick a, a mode. Let's do G Lydian. I'm just kind of thinking of something randomly. And the lowest triad would be E minor, right? So let's do one up and one down.
and adding a chromatic note. So see that what I'm doing now, that's what you want to be able to do. I don't have to think too much. I kind of know where that everything is. And if you can't do that, then that's the, that's the problem. So it's not about learning these things as licks or anything. It's just that I'm expanding my understanding of the fretboard and the notes of the scales and how everything is connected. So it's really nice to do the chromatic from below the top note. I like to do that with a slide. You get this Coltrane sounding, he played that all the time. Now, of course you could do this in different rhythms, but I'm not thinking about that now. That's for another day because you, you get overwhelmed with too much things to think about. I'm just, again, going from here to here and trying to find out where my gray areas are, where I'm not sure of where things are on the fretboard. So again, another key, let's do a B flat. Uh, let's do G Lydian. No, let's do, we did that. Let's do G Phrygian. F minor is the lowest. So before this video, I was going to say, I don't have to do this anymore because I've done it. So, you know, but it's a little bit uh, humbling because I noticed that I'm not so sure of these things as I might think that I am. I noticed, for example, here that I was struggling a little bit with G Phrygian. And why should I be that? If I am playing tunes, G Phrygian is going to be all over the place and I need to be able to just play whatever I want to play, right? I don't want to be... I, want, I don't want to be an obstacle that I don't know where the notes are. So with triads, you can do a lot of different patterns. You do all the inversions. He even does spread triads, right? The... With those inversions. And all that stuff. He takes it pretty far. Next chapter is chordal triads. So I've had this discussion before. It's a chordal triad, a triad. He calls them triads. So fourths, C major, or any, any mode. There is this debate of, is this, is this easy or difficult to play on the guitar? Because you can do this. But if you want to use more individual finger for each note, it's actually very tricky. But you can use the, take advantage of the guitar and go like Frank Gambale, right? Again, tons of patterns. Let's do B flat Lydian. And I pick a fourth pattern, maybe an inversion of a fourth. So instead of going, Version. You could spend a year with just those patterns. Then something called diatonic interval variation. 
We're still going back to the thirds. That's where we started, right? So I'm playing a third and I'm going to the next note of the scale for the next third and the next note E. But you don't have to do that. Here, for example, he goes the interval of a fourth in thirds. So I'm starting from a third. It's almost like I'm playing where I am playing an extended arpeggio and I'm adding a fourth to every note. That's even better with Lydian. So I'm thinking from C, from E, from G, from B, from D, from F sharp, from A. And then I'm attaching a fourth to each inch interval. It forces me to think about what I'm doing, which is good. Let's say I'll do sixths in that fashion. Or one up, one down, can I do that? See, this is you can do a lot of this. Imagine doing this with sevenths and all the intervals in every scale. You could spend a day on just that. You could spend more than a day on that. He talks about double fifths, so two fifths. All through the book, there's pictures of him and with different bands that he played with. I know him from Brecker Brothers and apparently he lived this crazy rock star life and I think there is even an autobiography by him which he talks about his crazy life if you are interested in that. Then he goes into the pentatonic scale. Now I'm gonna skip that now and move on to arpeggio studies. It's something we don't necessarily think about too much. So a triad as an arpeggio. <laughs> You could also play patterns like that might sound a little bit silly to some people but you want to make sure that you can do that so can you do that with a diminished triad say you couldn't do that let's say you can do well, that major is fine but the other triads not so fine that means you have there's a discrepancy meaning you're much better at playing major triads than diminished triads and yeah shouldn't be that you know you should it shouldn't matter what you're playing it should be easy another pattern would be this <laughs> Again, the diminished or something. Or you can break them up. So I like to do little etudes, just go through different chordal uh, chord progressions basically with these things. So maybe something like. So that 
that's inspired by John Petrucci, exercise from one of his books. Or if I do the this pattern instead. <laughs> doing it in time I'm not doing it with a metronome here for example I noticed that again I'm struggling a little bit so this I could turn into an exercise and use the metronome make sure that I can do it more effortlessly after a while next chapter is seventh chords same thing there you I don't often practice seventh chords like a C major 7 in patterns like <laughs> Do that with the same chord progression. Other seventh note arpeggios, can I do that with a minus seven flat five? Yes, I could. So many uh, really, really useful stuff. This then he does that with all the dominant and the dominant flat five and the dominant sharp five arpeggio. So, so much work. Again, it's the serious jazz practice book. Very serious. It even does it with like sus arpeggios and stuff like that. So for example, you could do a C major seven sharp or a major seven flat five. If I go back to the first example. could do that over the chords over inner urge Then there's a chapter on the, the diminished scale, which is a topic in and of itself. And there's a lot of stuff on that. And then he gets a little bit more esoteric at the end. And he gets into more kind of weirder chromatic uh, patterns and stuff like that. Chromatic triad studies. So that's the problem with the guitar, right? If I play something like this. I'm just moving the same fingering or it would be very different for a sax player but I also can try to find a where a place where I can switch work on this stuff too even though it, it's a little bit more it's not the same as the other stuff and if you want to work on all this crazy stuff that he talks about later on I would recommend 
this book instead of the thesaurus of scales and melodic patterns because that's much better it's something else that's not what i'm talking about here i was talking about knowing the major and the melodic minor scale all over the fretboard in every key that's the kind of thing that i would work from with this book i wouldn't use this book for the all that kind of uh, stranger stuff where it's built on intervallic shapes and stuff like that but there's something it talks about too which is a pivot chord right so or a pivot tone so for example this where the c is the pivot tone or That could also be something you could use like a chord progressions to create triads like C major to F minor to maybe C minor to D7. Gives you ideas on how to work on that kind of stuff, which is really interesting. Yeah, so it could be a pivoting kind of pattern, right? Uh, so that's that kind of stuff in here too several pages and uh, all sorts of stuff so that was a very scratch on the surface overview of uh, this book the serious jazz practice book one so it's kind of a hannon type book for jazz musicians then this book is a little bit different it deals with chord progressions so chord progressions that you find in jazz, like two, five, one would be a, a good example, but s every possible combination of two fives in different intervallic structures of that and chord progressions that you find in jazz, like giant steps, blues, rhythm changes, different standards that have very common chord progressions, one, six, two, five. And then he applies all this kind of stuff to that so this is a very good book too but i'll make another lesson about that this was the serious jazz practice book one so with all that thanks for your time and attention and i shall see you next time